We saw last week the fact that God has fishermen, and he has hunters. They're not the little ones, but the point is the hunters will go in every little cliff of rock. He'll dig out those. Uh, fishers are going to take the fish. And it's going to be those who have committed iniquity, and God is going to, to bring them to judgment. Their carcasses will be found. And we see that there is that leading up to our question, verses 19 through 21 of Jeremiah 16, where we, how would the nations know that God's name is Jehovah? Jehovah, if you read the bulletin, it gives you some insight into to that. It was, I thought it was instructive in, in trying to uh, put that in, on paper. The fact that uh, Jehovah was called upon in Genesis, but he tells the, God tells the people like the fathers of old of the Jews that you didn't know me by Jehovah. It's not a contradiction. You've got to find out how to harmonize it. But now you're going to know me. God's people are going to know me as Jehovah. The I am that I am self-existent. But there's, it goes deeper than that because it shows you that I am and I'm in the present because I will act upon my covenant promises. What he promises, he'll do. Idols will not do that. Idolatry will not do that. But Jehovah does. So it's interesting in verses 19 through 22 of this passage, does he contrast Jehovah with the problem of having gods? Puts the two together. You want to contrast? Here it is. I'm not like gods. I can act. And I can act according to my promise. And I am always present. I have, I have eternal existence. All those things work together as Jehovah, Yahweh, is, uh, is the term that the, the Hebrews would use. It's, it's translated a lot of times Adonai, which is Lord, in your, your modern tra translations. I like to know that Jehovah is used there, but in your modern translations, you'll see that it's, it's the Lord. But I want you to know that the Lord is Jehovah in those places. And when Jesus is Lord, he's, he's Jehovah. He is, uh, he is God. And uh, when you read the, the American Standard, that really stands out because it always uses Jehovah when it's Yahweh. And he used Lord when it's Adonai. So here is Je Je Jehovah is my strength. So he's appealing to Jehovah. So we, what, are, what would you say, they, what, will, what will be the indication that they will know my name is Jehovah? With those thoughts in mind, uh, how does he say that will come about? In your own words. And they'll probably be good. Huh? Okay. Verse 21, therefore, so we need to find out what's 19 through 20. Therefore, behold, I will cause them to know, this once will I cause them to know my hand and my might. So through his power, through his own hands, you know, he's acting. That's Jehovah. He is acting upon them. So I may say, because a lot of times, I'm going to bring judgment by my power and my hand, and you're going to know I am Jehovah. That's a scriptural concept. Is that what we see here? Well, that's the way it is all the time. Let's move on. No, I, I, want to, I want to know what this is. This is part of blessing. I think Jeremiah is looking way ahead until the time of of the messianic promises being fulfilled. Why would I say this? All right. Jehovah is my strength, my stronghold, my refuge in the day of affliction. Under thee shall the nations come from the ends of the earth and shall say, our fathers inherited nothing but lies. Why? Because we're serving idolatry. We're serving gods. They can't act upon anything. You do, Jehovah. That's your name. We're going to know it. And they're going to realize there's no other God but but one God, and we've been following lies, even vanity. They have, these gods haven't helped us. And things where there's no profit. Shall, and it just draws the question. Can a, shall a man make unto himself gods, which are yet no gods? They can do that, but what will it end in? in? Disappointment, failure, vanity, it flees by. Where are they in your day of trouble? The nations will come to realize there. Therefore, behold, I will cause them to know this once will I cause them to know. My hand and my might, they shall know my name is Jehovah. It's when the nations 
come together under the rule of the one true God. And that is Jesus Christ under the, the great plan that Jehovah, God the Father had in this case for his son. And I think these are pointers that Jeremiah has. Uh, he's prophesying to, to the people that indeed by following my will, this is the promises that are ahead. Nations are gonna flow into you. And I think when that happened was when the uh, nations became Gentile nations plus the Jews became God's people in Christ. And we know Jehovah is his name. He has a covenant that is with us greater than the old covenant. He has a promise he's made. He has fulfilled it by his hand, by the determinate counsel of God, he, he had Jesus crucified so he could be saved. And Jeremiah just, every once in a while, he'll, he'll point to those things. Isaiah kind of right there in your face about the sun and so forth. Uh, but Jeremiah points to those in times when in contrasting idolatry, which was so prevalent among the nations at, during these times of the Jews and in the times of, of Paul, uh, the apostle as well. So we enter into 17. Any comments or questions about that? Hope you have a concept of what Jehovah means. Chapter 17 and verse 1, the sin of Judah is written. And so we see the instruments. We want to know the importance that he says here about the instrument. What is the significance of the instrument and the place? The sin of Judah is graven, etched. You get the idea. This is going to be a little more permanent than just having a little grease smear. What is it? So what are the instruments? They are, it's a pen of what? Iron. And more to our, I just studied about the idea. It's the, the point of that is what? Diamond. It's, it's just, it's pretty hard. It is graven upon the tablet of their what? Of their heart. And upon the horns of their, see, we're still talking about idolatry. We're still talking about you know, not having the, the one true God. It's the horns of your altars, whilst their children remember their altars and their asherim by the green trees upon the high hills where they worship their own gods. And on my mountains in the field, it says, I will give thy substance and all thy treasure for a what? Spoil. He's bringing judgment. This is how, you know, Jehovah is known as well. But here's a blessing here in this context. But they're going to know this. The treasures are spoiled. He's going to bring the, the Chaldeans upon them. Thou even of thyself shalt, shalt dis, uh, discontinue from thy heritage. You had a promised land. You're not going to have that any longer that I gave thee. And I will cause thee to observe, observe thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. Where are they going? Babylon. And for ye have kindled a fire in my anger which shall burn forever. So he wants it engraven in their heart, their sin of idolatry. And wants them to know the direct connection with them going into Babylonian captivity, which they will. And Jeremiah speaks about it's going to be 70 years. And it exactly was. And 606 to 536. Just boom. It, it, God, it, it comes through. And we see that these things have happened. But my anger, it shall burn forever. And that it the judgment is coming upon them. So he doesn't move just totally away from the fact that you'll know me when these things happen. That's true. But I think it's so interesting that he opens it up and it says directly, you'll know me by my grace and my salvation that will come to, uh, to, to the nations. So it's a permanent statement of what they've done. And they're going to see the consequences of that. And that becomes very uh, important to uh, to God. All right. Number 11. What is the difference in the heart of those who are cursed and blessed? Okay. And is it interesting that when he talks about those who are blessed, he just speaks one thing. I got three things on the side of cursed. Do you? Just got one thing on the side of blessed. 
Why? Because you don't need any more. Well, the side of, of the cursed are those that put their trust in whom? They put their trust in man. Yes, they don't put their trust in, in, in God. And so that's a, that's a, that's a problem. Uh, what do they do about their arm and their flesh? What do they depend upon? That's right. Their fleshly arm, that's their power. And, you know, they, and they, they turn away from, uh, from Jehovah. You know, they go serve him. But you trust in Jehovah, that's all you need to do. You need to reverence him. So who's going to be your power? Not the man's arm and flesh, not man's ability. It's God's power. And you're not going to turn away from him because you trust in Jehovah. He didn't have to say the other two. Because you put your trust in Jehovah, that answers it all. And it will affect how you, you, you will turn from those things that are, are wrong and turn aside which is, is good. So what will they, they be like? First of all, in verse, in verse 6, you'll be like a shrub or a tamarisk, a wild tamarisk shrub. But some versions have heath. It'll be a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good cometh but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness and salt land and not inhabited so you grow up you you're a bush and you're going to be this is this is where you both find yourself sometime you're happy with it i guess that's what I, i'm a wild bush that's where i'm supposed to be the land's well, salt people are not going to be there to call, call but that's where i am and they will not know the blessings that are coming because they're so satisfied with this, which is so horrible. But those who are going to be blessed and not cursed, they're going to be ones that trust in Jehovah. And what does verse 8 say? They shall be like a tree planted by the waters. It spreadeth out its roots by the river and shall not fear when he cometh, but its leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Why? Because it rivers nearby. They'll be, they'll, be, they'll be taken care of. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Very much positive things about that tree. Is it true that, that roots spread toward water? Is that, that really true? Or is that just, that's just prose? Is that correct? He didn't say that. So we're, we'll learn some, some botany. He, did, he didn't say, well, you, we need to go to science class and learn that. We're learning what occurs in nature. And he uses that reality about what about what happens you plant you know things in these containers you need you scrape those leaves i mean those roots so they can not be bound they can spread out uh, you learn that that's how things operate in nature and it's just so accurate when he presents that you're going to be an old dried up bush and say you don't even know when the blessings come are you going to be one planted by the river where the blessings are and the fountain of, of water is is god and so he's, he's speaking in the, don't, you don't make it the flesh his arm. <laughs> you know, that's not, I'm not depending upon man, but we're, we're depending upon on God, and that becomes a, a blessing for us. So there's, there's the difference in the heart. We rely upon God if we're going to be that free by the river. And that becomes important. Explain why the heart is something man cannot know. Verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and is exceedingly corrupt. Who can know it? Search me, O God, and know that I'm righteous before thee. You think you know your heart? And Calvinists say you can't know your heart. God's got to, you, 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 you just can't do that. God's got to make it, make, turn your heart. It's, it's deceitful. You never know when you're saved anyway. It's God's power going to come up on you. So we want to see, well, is that true? Or maybe there's some accuracy here in this that it is exceedingly corrupt. Who can know it? And then you, you have Jehovah searches the mind. He tries the heart. And how does, what does he do? When you go the route of your heart, 
you're going to have to experience the consequences. He gives to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Now, before we get to the partridge sitting on eggs, what's your answer to that? What's, what's the Bible behind that? What's the mind of God that is accurate that we can understand the context, maybe the limitations? I can know my heart. I swear to God, I am honest. No, you don't know if you're honest or not. You don't know it. It's deceitful. I believe we can know it. God's, God's people say it all the time. Apostles did it. So I've got to find something else that is going to be the point of why I don't rely upon man. Why is that? I want that. That's the, that's the most important thing I want. I want that, and let's go spend the money and go get that. And you find out when you got that, that wasn't a very wise move. My heart said I wanted it. But what can it be? It can be deceitful. What does God say? You'll suffer the consequences of your choices. That does that mean that, that I can't think, well, I want that, and that might be a good thing. But it might be a bad thing. Things in your life that you wanted, thought that was the most important thing, you realize later, I'm so glad I didn't get that. I'm so glad that didn't happen out the way I thought it would be because look at the trouble that I would be in. That's happened to me more than once. Thought I thought that would be a good thing uh, to, to do and follow. You look back, thank you. Thank you, Kathy, for saying that might not be a good thing to do. Thank you, God, for helping me to, to see a better way for accomplishing things than the way I was going. And he's just saying it's deceitful. Who can know it? Because it may be a good thing. It may be a bad thing. But the point is, do not rely upon your own understanding. Rely upon who? Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. Rely upon God. Commit your ways to him and he'll fulfill your desires. I want you, your will to be done, God. And he will fulfill those desires. So it's not that you can't act upon your heart. He tells the young man to follow the ways of your heart and be cheerful. <laughs> no, I can't do that. It's deceitful. I don't know it. Yeah, you do. You can, you can turn to God, but realize that when you start thinking, I think I'll do it this way, God, and you're not seeking the will of God, and you make a choice, you, you'll be judged according to that. He, he says that to the young people well, as well. But you'll, you'll, you'll suffer those consequences. So who can know it in the sense that I have everything worked out and the route I'm going is the way it's going to be and that's, that's going to be good. And here's the partridge, the bird that he speaks about here. As the partridge that sitteth on eggs which, has, which she hath not laid, so is he that getteth riches and not by the right way. I got something and I didn't get it the right way, but I got it. It says, in the midst of his days, they shall leave him, meaning the riches shall leave him, and his end, he shall be a fool. Like the bird that sat on the eggs when the eggs become real. We're not of the same family tree, and they're gone. <laughs> and the partridge is sitting there, what a fool I was. <laughs> I hatched them. <laughs> I, was, I was good. What, what, happened, what happened to me? You're a fool. They didn't belong to you. And riches belong to God. He blesses us, and we need to be good stewards of what we have. Thank God for what we have, but seek God's will and how we're going to use them. And that's the deceitfulness of the heart. We need to not rely upon our own understanding, but commit our ways to God. And he'll work out those ways because it will be according to his will. But a lot of times we have to sit, think through this thing. We don't want to make that move. There's consequences we hadn't thought about before. And ask God to help us, and he will. Any, any comments on that? About the deceitfulness of the heart? I know the way of man is not himself. We talked about that in January, Jeremiah 10. And there's a truth to that. But in that context, it was that you can't determine that you're going to escape the judgment of God. The way of man is not in himself. That God's going to bring judgment and you're not going to have anything to do about it. 
that's that. We can't determine, well, I'll be all right and I'll, I'll escape judgment. No. That way of man is not in himself. It's not a man that walketh, direct his own steps of he's going to escape judgment. And, but a lot of times, there's a principle there, and that's this, that we don't know everything, and we must be careful how we act. Yes, ma'am. I know. I, we, I think we have. It, and that's why I stay with the word because it, it, it can make, it can judge the heart and help, help us to see that. So I think that's with the word of God and then prayer. Uh, prayer, I lack wisdom about this. I pray for wisdom. God will give it to us. And uh, you combine that with the, with the word, Paul, uh, for Timothy, that think on these things and God will give you understanding. Uh, because what we read, we can have understanding by, by God helping us. Yes? Right. That's good. That's right. Okay. That's, that's, that's good. What blessing and curse did Jeremiah connect with keeping and not keeping the Sabbath day holy? Is Jeremiah living under the old law? God's people were too. And they were, they were, they were violating uh, that. And so the blessings and, and curses of, of, of that. Uh, verses 12, just a note here. Uh, and because we're going to come back to uh, this because Jeremiah is going to I'm going to use this in a, in a couple of questions we're going to have a little later how mistreated he was a glorious throne on verse 12 on high from the beginning is a place of our sanctuary and Jehovah the hope of Israel for, says and all that forsake thee shall be put to shame well he, Jeremiah is kind of wanting his enemies to be put to shame and we'll talk about that uh, in, in question number 16. So we drop down to verse 18. Jehovah said unto me, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people whereby the kings of Judah come in and by which they go out and all the gates of Jerusalem and say to them, Hear ye the word of Jehovah, ye kings of Judah and all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They enter in these gates. Take heed to yourselves, bear no burden on the Sabbath day and bring it and nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day. Neither do you any work but hollow the Sabbath day as I commanded the Father. So he puts, he wants to go to Jeremiah, go in a prominent place where the kings enter in, in the city. High gate, some versions have. The chief gate of entrance that would be where the, the nobles would come in. And what I read it kind of hurriedly, but tell me in layman's terms just what's happening on the Sabbath day connected with the city of Jerusalem. Get a get an idea what what's happening. Business as usual, buying and selling, taking things to the house, taking it to Jerusalem, come coming out of that. There's they're buying and selling. Uh, they're carrying their burdens that they bought, and and uh, it it's, it's kind of. It's kind of like a, uh, you know, a day at the market. And it was the Sabbath day. It was the seventh day. It was a day in which was set aside that they were not to do any work. And they're going to be punished for, for this. Or they're going, to be, they're going to be blessed. And so in verse 23, but they hearken not, neither incline their ear. When you incline your ear, you kind of lower that ear to listen. And if they're not, they're stiff-necked. It just the imagery is there that but made their neck stiff that they might not hear and might not receive instruction so he's now 
go, setting forth warnings and the blessings that you keep that, you will be blessed, but don't do that work on that day. Not like then it's usual that you have during the other days of the week. Here again, was there a stiff neck? Now, idolatry's there. We're going to not obey the clear commandments of, of, of God, and that becomes very, very, very important. Any comments on that? Verse 24, uh, and it shall come to pass, if you diligently hearken to me, said Jehovah, bring no burden. Verse 25, then shall you enter by the gates of the city, and look what he points to. Kings and princes sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and horses. They and their princes, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the city shall remain forever. And they shall come from the cities of Judah, Jerusalem, land of ba uh, Benjamin, from the lowland, from the hill country, from the south, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices uh, unto the, the city. But if you will not hearken unto me, to hollow the Sabbath day and not to, and, and not to bear a burden and are not the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. I will kindle a fire in the gates thereof. I'll devour the palace of Jerusalem and it shall not be quenched. You can stand forever as people around will bring their sacrifices to Jerusalem like God had always planned it. There'll be plenty of activity being done according to the law of God, but not on the Sabbath. You're not going to bring all of that t together and if you don't heed that I'll burn down your city and he did he did through the Chaldeans and if you want to remain uh, a city that Jeremiah was trying to get them to see this is what you're going to have to do blessings and curses he brings upon it. here's here's the choices that are there but you're going to have to heed the word of, of Jehovah all right question number 14 what is the application of the parable of the potter's vessel? Chapter 18 and verse 1. He's been, he's been sent to the gates of Jerusalem, a prominent place. Now he goes to a place where a potter is working. Go down to the potter's house, and there will I cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he was making a work on the wheels. And when the vessel that he made of the clay was marred in the hand of the potter, he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. And when we think about that, when we think about authority, who has the authority, the vessel or the potter who made it? The Bible argues that all the time. You don't make the potter, the potter makes you. Who's the potter? It's God, who are you? You're his creation. Who are you to complain against God? That's Paul in Romans. But here, something is marred, and the potter makes something good according to his will. Again, that authority is still there, but in a, in a context here where he's trying to show that I will tear down that which I have established. The word of Jehovah came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot, cannot I do with you as this potter? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to break down and to destroy it? But if that nation concerning which I have spoken turn from their evil, I will change my mind, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And here, they're turning from their ways. I don't have to destroy them. I wanted, I was going to. They turn from their evil. But the other side of that, when they do not, if they do that which is evil in my sight, verse 10, that they obey not my voice, then I'll repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So it kind of works the opposite way, especially when I wanted that to be good, but it, it's marred. Uh, I will... I will change my mind. I will bring them down. Verse 11, Now therefore speak to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus said Jehovah, Behold, I frame evil against you. Oh God, you would never do that. Yes, I do. I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now everyone from his evil way and amend your doings. But they said it is vain, for we will walk after our own devices and we'll do everything one after the stubbornness of his evil heart. 
there's a passage that we'll understand from the scriptures that, that I, I create evil. Isaiah said that. Now you know what that means. I will create the evil day you're going to experience because you're going to be, your city's going to be burned. You're going to be brought to judgment. He's not morally evil, and he creates a moral evil. He creates evil that you feel it in judgment. He creates the evil that, that hurts. He brings forth the circumstances that will bring evil of, upon, upon you from your perspective. That's not good. <laughs> and, and therefore, it's, it's judgment again. So he has the right to determine how that vessel is going to turn out at the end. And we have the obligation to submit to the mind and the wisdom of the potter for, for, in order for us to be, to be blessed. Question number 15. What horrible thing had the virgin of Israel done? Why would she call her a virgin? She doesn't belong to any other, she doesn't belong to any other God. She doesn't belong to any man. Ask me now among the nations who hath heard such things. A virgin of Israel had done a very horrible thing. What do you think she'd done? She'd gone off to idolatry. She's not been faithful. And he gives this imagery. Shall the snow of Lebanon fall from the rock of the field? No, it won't. Or shall the cold waters that flow down from, uh, the, uh, from afar be dried up? No, that's not the way it happens. I remember in the, in the summertime, in Flagstaff, Arizona, go up to the high mountains, and on the rocks, snow was still there. When you're from Texas, you don't have that happen. Snow was on the rock. All these big, wonderful trees of Lebanon, uh, the, the snow's going to be there. It's not going to fail from the rock, even after the temperatures are starting melting the, the, the ground from other places. It's going to be on the cold rock. Again, nature is true. And we see it. And the flow down from the far, he dried up. No, they're going to be flowing from the mountains, the streams, when the snow comes. That's the imagery there. For my people have forgotten me. Do you think that might be the evil that the virgin of Israel has done? I'd put it there. They've forgotten me. Who did they replace me with? Idolatry. They have burned incense to the false gods. And they have, made, have been made to stumble in their ways. In the ancient past, they should be walking to walk and bypass in a way not. He did, they didn't tell you to get off freeway. He didn't tell you to get off here. In a way not cast up. See, God's way is always a highway. It stands up from everything else. And what you, you didn't like it. And therefore, you don't incline your ear to that, and you, stiff, you have a stiff neck, and you'll forget about God. That's what they did. And I will make their land an, stab, a, an astonishment and a perpetual hissing, and everyone that passes thereby shall be astonished and shake his head. I will scatter them as the east wind before the enemy. I will show them the, my back, or show them the back and not the face in the day of their calamity, the evil day that they will experience. I devised it, God said. He's bringing judgment upon them. Why? Because of their idolatry. Just another way of, of driving that home. I know our time is shortened, but I'd like to hear what you have to say. Can the Christian react today towards his enemies as Jeremiah did? Won't be able to cover them all, but I'd like you to think about them. Two places in our, this section of scripture where he appeals to God for, to Jeremiah's credit, and this is where I, I pray that I will talk to God and have the, the, the mind when, I'm comp when I want to talk to God how bad I'm treated. <laughs> it comes that down to that. And I want vindication. I want to, de I delivered unto you my cause, chapter 20, O Jehovah of heavens that tries the righteous and sees the heart. Let me see thy vengeance on them. For unto thee have I revealed my cause. I don't want my vengeance on them, God. I want your vengeance. Now, what comes to be, I'm being fair with Jeremiah right now. 
in, in the scriptures. From Jeremiah's perspective, do you, do you think he's appealing to God's vengeance when he says, I want them to be fatherless? Is that the way God's vengeance would come? I want them to have famine. Every one of those things is going to happen when the Babylonians come on them. Sword. And all through these things, he's, the, 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 child, the people were childless in, in chapter 18 and verse 21. Let, every, let, let a cry be heard from their houses when thou shalt bring a troop suddenly upon them. For they digged a pit to take me and his snares for my feet. You might think, well, you're just a little selfish, Jeremiah. And he may be. He's hurting. But when you take that away, when especially in chapter 20, he said, I want you to see thy, thy vengeance. And he says it earlier as well. Take that away. What is he talking about in particular that God's vengeance will not accomplish? Uh, literally. I don't read anything. It's horrible. Now, can a Christian have this attitude in 1823? Yet Jehovah, thou knowest their counsel against me to slay me. Forgive not their iniquity, neither blot their sin from thy sight. But let them be overthrown before thee, that thou wilt deal with them in the time of, of, of thine anger. We don't ask people that are hurting us to Ask God to forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's how Jesus prayed. Luke 23, 34. What about you, Stephen? Acts 7, 60. When they're stoning you to death, you're God's minister. Lay not this sin to their charge. That's, that, that's not Jeremiah. Look at Psalm 109, because this is David. And this is one of those psalms wanting God's vengeance to come upon the unrighteous. But I want you to see what David said in verse 12. Let there be none to extend kindness unto him, neither let there be any to have pity on the fatherless children. What children have to do with it? They belong to their own dad. Don't have pity on the father, his fatherless children. Verse 13, let his prosperity, posterity be cut off, and the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with Jehovah, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. And we want all this to come upon them, and Peter tells us in chapter 2 and verse 1, the very first thing that we put away is all malice. Malice is wanting somebody to hurt. Wanting somebody to, the, the evil come upon them. And so I lay that out there for you to make up your mind. Could you as a, a Christian, uh, knowing how Christ and his, his, his spokesman and his inspired apostles. Can we as Christians wish uh, malice upon them? But at the same time, we can say, God, come, come, come in judgment. And what do we know about that judgment? You know, that's eternal in nature. Was this going to be eternal in nature, that they're going to lose their soul because they did that? You know, a lot of this will be, they're going to die physically. Of course, idolatrous, they're losing their soul too, with no opportunity to change. But it's, it's a big battle, and different people feel differently about it. But I'll lay those out there for you to make your uh, de decision upon those. Can I pray to God, and wanting His vengeance to come, knowing what that might mean, while at the same time, having this type of mentality, don't forgive their sin, don't have pity upon the fatherless children in our day in Christ. 
and that will be something that we'll, we'll have to think about. We'll, we'll talk more about it. Any, any thoughts right now while it's on your mind that you could add that might help us? Well, that's what Jeremiah did. That's what he did. I don't want my vengeance. I want to see yours. But I'm saying, what did that vengeance look like? And he, 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 he doubled down on it. <laughs> and that's the, that's the dilemma. Because he said exactly what it was. In fact, he goes against, uh, I, I don't want your sin to be blotted out. And there may be a context there. As long as they're going to keep sinning like that, I don't want their sin to be blotted out. I want righteousness to prevail. And I think that too. Uh, and I said, well, that, that may be what changes it but you 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 think about that and, and lord willing next time we'll we'll talk about that our time is up thank you